Good morning. Welcome to Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Uh, my name is uh, Pastor Jan, and my husband is Pastor uh, Mike Osminski. Uh, first of all, I want to wish you all a blessed new year. I'm praying that God will especially um, speak to us, and, and, and we especially hear His voice, and we follow where He leads. I pray that in this hour. So I'm going to open up with prayer, and then I'm going to read out of Psalm 69. So if you want to have your Bibles there, and also I will go right into communion, so you need your elements. Dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity for us to gather together, Lord. We are so fortunate, Lord, that there is technology available, Lord, that some of us um, can stay home and feel safe while others can venture out. Lord, I just ask, dear God, that you you provide for this congregation, Lord. You keep us safe. You keep um, the hand of the evil one away from us, Lord. And I just pray in this year, Lord, we would be a guiding light for others, Lord, that so desperately need you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to look at Psalm 69. Um, before I start, and it's long, and I, I decided I'm going to read the whole thing. I want you to think about as I read it and as you follow along. Um, who do you think is speaking? Whose voice do you hear? And maybe you hear more than one voice in this psalm. So here I go. Save me, O oh God. Save me, O oh God, for the waters have come up to my neck, and I sink in deep mire. I sink in deep mire where there's no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs on my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O oh Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me. O oh God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's children, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth from my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O Lord, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters and not and let not the flood water overflow me nor let the water swallow me up and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, and there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. 
And they also gave me gall for my food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them. And their well-being well a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see. And make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them. And let your wrathful anger take hold of them. And let their dwelling place be desolate. And let no one live in their tents. For they persecute the ones you have struck. And talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity. And let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. And not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O oh God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than ox or bull which have horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Well, so what did you think? Who wrote this psalm? Um, some say Jeremiah did, because uh, Jeremiah was being uh, chased and persecuted, and he did hide in a in a ditch. Um, and then others think it was David. David also was being persecuted and chased, and and um, his life was in danger. But when I read it, not all of it, but a lot of it resounded in me that it was the voice of Jesus um, on the cross. And you know that this psalm is uh, uh, quoted more in the New Testament, almost as much as Psalm 22. And there's a lot of references to things that are in this psalm in the New Testament. I want us, though, to think about, could it be us? Could we have written this? Could this be a cry from our own hearts? The very beginning, save me, O oh God. When things happen to us, and they can be large, they can be small, but many of us take those so seriously whatever they are. And I was thinking about Jesus this morning. When he went to the cross, he was a dead man walking. He was going to his execution. And he didn't scream. He didn't yell out. He walked quietly and calmly. Or they dragged him. Whatever. But he did not scream and yell and carry on. I mean, we get paper cuts and you would think that we lost a limb. Save me, O oh God, for the waters have come up to my neck, and I sink in deep mire, where there is no standing, I've come into deep water, where the floods overflow me, I am weary with my crying, my throat is dry, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. I think so many of us, when we encounter something that is meant to strengthen us, we, we retreat. We retreat into our, our hiding places. And we cry. And we cry and we cry. The bad part about that is many times we stay there way too long and we don't listen for God's voice. We don't wait to hear God coming. 
We do not. We give up. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. They, My eyes fail. No, I fail. I fail to hear him say, okay, you know what? I feel your pain for that. I feel your pain because you didn't get your, your promotion. I feel your pain because you didn't get that girl you wanted. I feel your pain for um, um, not being able to... Uh, be a pastor, be a minister, whatever it is that fill in the blank. I feel your pain, Jesus says. But you will you wait for me? Will you wait for me and see what I have in store for you? And I think so many of us we just we we don't. And then when you when you go down and and then you know, you know David whoever wrote it talks about a lot of things that are happening to him and how sad and and how awful it is. And then um, in verse 16, he says, um, Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. See, we have to, at some point, yeah, we, we can wallow in our sorrow for a, a short time. We can go and sob before the Lord. He doesn't care about that. It's when we select to stay there, when we decide that our pain is greater than God, that I can't wait to see God. I cannot wait. My eyes are my eyes are all teared out. I can't wait for God anymore. And then um, I wanted to look at um, the parts, you know, where like verse nineteen. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. And in David, whoever wrote it, talks about. Their table became a snare before them, and and their well-being a trap, and their eyes be darkened, and and they do not see, and and make their loins shake continually. Pour on your indignation upon them, and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. God doesn't talk like that. This is the opposite of God. This is our voice. This is David's voice. It's man saying. Let no one live in their tents, for they persecuted the ones who have struck and talk of the grief of those who have wounded in equity, iniquity to the iniquity. And let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. And that's how we get. We get, we get in this place. We get where we feel like we're drowning. We're overcome. The waters are just the, going over our heads and the currents pulling us under. We have nowhere to stand anymore. And so what do we do? We want to strike out in anger. We want, we want to strike out to our enemies. We want to see them blotted out of the book of life. Jesus came to do the opposite. Jesus came and said, love your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Jesus never said, you know, yeah, go after them. Beat the living daylights out of them. He never said that. Verse 29, but I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. And I will praise the name of God with a song. And I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an axe or bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. And those who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. If you go back to um, 13, but, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O Lord, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut its mouth on me. See, when we find ourselves in those places where we feel there's no hope, where we feel that um, everything we've worked for is gone, Jesus says, to turn to him, to, to look to him. And you know yourself better than, than I do. When you get upset, 
and maybe it's justifiable. Maybe somebody really did you wrong. But what did Jesus do? What did he tell us to do? To love those people. To turn the other cheek. To give them your extra robe. Not your extra robe, I take that back. To give them your robe, your coat. That you may go without. To show real love. This year, this year is a new beginning for us. May we not wallow in self-pity. Yes, I can be disappointed, but I need to take it to God and be released. I need to turn to Him and say, Okay, what's, what's the next plan? What are you doing? How are you going to help me? And you know, when He says in verse uh, 29, But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. See, we need to pray that. We need to pray that when we get in our funk, that God takes us and places us on a higher plane, moves us up, moves us up out of our misery, moves us up under that higher plane so that we can experience the the eternal, excuse me, the eternal God. You can stay You can stay in the miry clay. You can stay where you can't move. Your feet are stuck. You can stay in there. But why would you want to? Why would you want to when God has so much more for you? So I just pray today that, you know, this, this, to me, this psalm reflects many voices many many voices and it and it is a gateway for us when we're feeling down when we're feeling discouraged when we feel like life isn't playing out like we want it to that we read this and we say verse 29 but i am poor and sorrowful let your salvation O oh god set me up on high move me up jesus Move me up from that low place to the high place with you. Let me soar with you, Jesus. Let me, let me go places in victory as you did. May I be a person that could walk to her execution like you did and not shed one tear for myself. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And yet we shed tears all the time for insignificant things in our life. So, Jesus, during this time, communion is is such an intense memory. We weren't there to witness it, but we can read in the scriptures, in the gospels, what took place. And Lord, I don't know if I really, if many of us would have had the guts to stay there and watch, watch you be persecuted. I don't know if we would have had the guts to uh, not worry about our own lives being uh, arrested for you. But Lord, I pray in this hour that we do have the guts that we do have the courage and that we do in our sorrow cry out to you for an answer and no longer wallow in the dark places, no longer stay in the hidden places, but come out and celebrate you. I pray and thank you again for your wonderful gift, dear Jesus, your wonderful gift of your body in your blood. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I thank you again for shedding your blood. I thank you, Lord, for suffering the unimaginable 
of doing it for us, Lord. Taking those breaths that were so hard to take. But doing it for us, knowing that your death would set us free. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. I don't know what my husband's going to say today. I know he's going to be teaching on the Psalms, but I read the, um, some people sent um, prophetic words they felt like they received from God for the year, the upcoming year, and I was really moved. I was really moved by um, so many of them. But I, but I but I do need to say this. I I was really moved by my sons. I I, I said to my husband, did he really write this? I, I was really um, moved, but not just by his, but really by all of them that were sent. Um, thank you for sharing what God is doing in our land this year, and may we be faithful to carry it out. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're going to continue on looking at the Psalms prophetically. We are finishing up the second book of the Psalms, which runs from Psalm 42 through 72. Today, Jan read 69. And we are in the middle of this stretch of that book known as the second Davidic Psalter, Psalms 51 through 65. Fifteen consecutive psalms are attributed to David. 66 and 67 then are a communal response, the response of the people of God to David's psalms. 68, 69, and 70 again are attributed to David. 71 is attributed to no one, but as oftentimes is the case, when in the middle of um, a number of psalms that are attributed to a certain individual or individuals, and a psalm has no superscription, it, oftentimes it means that the psalm before it and this psalm were a single psalm. So again, many texts show 70 and 71 as being a single psalm, again, which would mean David wrote all of those. And then 72 closes with a psalm of Solomon. Now, one of the things we have to remember in Hebrew, um, the preposition of, as in of David or of Solomon, can actually mean for David or for Solomon. And there's a certain logic that Psalm 72 would read for Solomon, and therefore it was probably written by David before he died, uh, speaking prophetically um, and speaking wisdom for son, his son Solomon, who would succeed him as the king. Now that, that says something important here about Psalm 51 through 72. 51 through 72 really speaks of the succession, succession to the throne of David by his son Solomon. Solomon was actually, uh, well, more than likely fourth in the line of, of succession. David's sons, uh, Amnon, would have been first in line. Absalom was second in line. Adonijah was third in line, and Solomon would have been fourth in line. But the succession went to Solomon because the Lord commanded David that Solomon would receive the kingship. And it's, it's through Solomon. Uh, it's through Solomon that Jesus traces his line of descent. Amnon, of course, was murdered. Um, Absalom rebelled against his father David and perished. Adonija wanted to be the king after David died, 
but Solomon was given the kingship. So there's there what we see here in Psalm 51 through Psalm 72, we see the establishment of David's kingship. In in the first book, the Genesis book, again, the first 41 Psalms, the majority of those Psalms are attributed to David, and that speaks of David's kingship. David, nonetheless, is in this second book because the connection between David and Solomon is who is going to succeed David as king. And so really the central focus in this second book, this Exodus book, who's going to succeed David? In other words, who's going to get the inheritance? And that, of course, is similar to the book of Exodus. The second book of Psalms is the Exodus book, just as the first book of Psalms was the Genesis book. And in Exodus, God is choosing his son, Israel. Israel is his son, and he is choosing his son, to be the kingdom of priests, the, 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 the divine kingly ruling priesthood in the earth to establish the kingdom of God in the earth. Solomon establishes the kingdom of God through the vehicle of the nation of Israel. And so we see this, again, the Psalms is an eschatological picture. It shows us and teaches us God's plan for establishing his purposes in the earth. And we need, we really need to understand the significance of this. That's why the main topic in Psalm 51 through 72 is hindrances to the succession of David. David is given the kingship and now the kingship has to be passed on. Egypt at the time uh, of the the book of Exodus, is the dominant nation in the earth. But again, the Lord wants to remove their dominance and establish the dominance of Israel as being the vehicle for God's kingdom in the earth. We also see, of course, um, uh, uh, this phenomenon repeats itself all throughout Scripture. God establishing his kingdom through his people by his choice, by his election, by his ways, according to his purposes, by his grace. And we see these hindrances to the establishment of God's kingdom. The nations of the earth oppose Israel, seek to enslave Israel, seek to tread Israel down to wear out Israel. Saul is the first king of Israel and Saul seeks to establish his authority as opposed to David's authority. He persecutes David. David becomes the king. And of course, David's becoming the king is the subject of the first book of the Psalms, Psalms 1 through 41, how God begins and originates his kingdom. But now in book two, In book two, when we look at David, now David as the king is assaulted. David as the king is attacked to stop the kingship from being established by David and given to the son of God's choice, Solomon. And that's why we start in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, we see the dangers. We see the hindrances. We see the problems. We see the warfare that David goes through in this succession process of establishing his kingship and then passing it on to Solomon for Solomon in turn to establish that kingship. So 51, and just a review of what we've covered so far. In 51, This is why these psalms are not chronological in terms of the episodes of David's life to which they relate, but they're theological. They're they're simply showing you all the hindrances and dangers that David will undergo, that David will face to hinder the establishment of the kingdom of God in him and through him and in his seed and in his line. And that's why everything starts with Psalm 51. Now, it's important as we move through the theological themes that these psalms present for us to teach us 
But the first hindrance is David's own sin. It's an internal hindrance. All of us, as the people of God, and remember, we're not just looking at Israel. We're not just looking at Old Testament history. We're looking at the people of God. We're looking at the church. We are the sons of God. We are those who have been given the kingdom of heaven, not the nations of the earth to establish them, but God's covenant people, the church. We are given the kingdom, to establish that kingdom in the earth. It is for the nations, but it's not by the nations. Keep that in mind, and we will see this. As, as these psalms progress, David starts to deal prophetically with the nations of the earth. It's not just about Israel and his kingship and, and the succession by Solomon. It's about the nations of the earth coming under the authority of the Lord. And we're going to see that progressively as we move from Psalm 51 through to Psalm 72. The nations of the earth do not establish God's kingdom. The kingdom is established for them in and by and through the church, in and by and through the gospel. And the nations then all gather, all the nations of the earth. This isn't, this isn't, there's, there's no biblical scenario, no eschatological scenario, no prophetic scenario that says the United States is going to establish God's kingdom in the earth. God's people, the church, will establish that kingdom. And who will enter into that kingdom? Well, if we look in the Old Testament, see, this is the purpose of the nation of Israel. This is the prophetic significance of Israel in the Old Testament. Israel becomes the picture of, a, of, of, a, of an ideal national political entity that is exercised by God, that is dealt with by God, that is dealt with as a people by God in order to conform to the righteousness of the Lord. And they become a pattern for all the nations of the earth. God deals with Egypt in the Old Testament. God deals with Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and both the Old and the New Testament. He deals with the nations in the same manner he deals with Israel as a nation. Now, Israel has this dual function in Scripture. Israel is, is a, a, a picture of the ideal nation and how God exercises his government in the nations of the earth, but Israel is also a picture of people who are in covenant relationship with Yahweh, and so they become a picture for the church. They're, they're actually, they have this dual purpose of being the ideal nation and a representation of God's covenant people. God deals with all the nations the way he deals with Israel as a nation. And that's the pattern. America's not the pattern. Spoiler alert. Israel is the pattern, the only pattern. And the Lord will deal with the United States the same way he de dealt with Israel. He will deal with Russia the same way he dealt with Israel. He will deal with China the same way he, de he dealt with Israel. He will deal with South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, Burma, Thailand, India, the same way he dealt with Israel. We need to understand this. And it the book of Revelation concludes with the nations of the earth coming in submission to the Lord, to his Messiah, and his spirit. That's how the book of Revelation ends. The, the church is there bearing witness to the Lord, standing for the Lord, walking in God's authority, and the nations of the earth bring their glory and their honor into the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem the new heavens and the new earth. Now, that's important to understand. This is how scripture functions. This is, how, this is a biblical world view. We sometimes substitute our world view for a biblical world view, but that doesn't make it a biblical world view. Somehow making the United States the center of God's 
kingdom purposes for the earth is not a biblical worldview. Israel, you can't take Israel's place and you can't take the church's place. And there are only those two. Everybody else conforms to that image. But back to David now. How does God deal with his people in establishing the kingdom? Well, the first enemy that David must face is his own sin. And that's why everything starts with Psalm 51 in this, this, this sequence. In 52, David deals with the enemy of powerful men who oppose him. In Psalm 53, David deals with fools who oppose him, dangerous fools. In Psalm 54, David deals with a group of his own people opposing him. His, his brothers and sisters, his covenant relationship. We would say today, members in the church opposing God's very purpose for the church. Psalm 55, we, we said last week, Psalm 55, it, it, it speaks of multivalence. Multivalence shows how a, a certain passage in scripture, a psalm in this case, can, can be interpreted to show many different levels of meaning. This is a psalm about betrayal. The other psalms are psalms of betrayal. David's own heart betrays him. Strong men betray him. His own people betray him. Fools oppose him. Psalm 55 is about an intimate friend betraying him. We spoke about this last week. Uh, 55, 12 says, For it's not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It's not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. And we talked about this closeness, this intimacy, this frequency, this deep relationship. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked with the crowd. And we, we suggested last week that this, this is on many different levels. We talked about David giving voice because the, the language in Psalm 51 or Psalm 55 here speaks of um, a vulnerable person being severely abused and injured by someone close to him or her. So, so on, on one level, on, on one level of the multivalence, this speaks of the powerful using their power to violate to violate the poor, the weak, the vulnerable. On another level, we said David is giving voice to the story of his daughter Tamar, who was raped by her brother Amnon. We said Amnon was the first in line. Uh, he was the heir apparent to David's kingship, but he violated his sister Tamar. And the second in line, Absalom, then murdered, murdered Amnon because Tamar was Absalom's full sister. And this, of course, sets in motion all of this in 2 Samuel uh, uh, 12 and 2 Samuel 13 and 14 through 19. This whole rebellion of Absalom, this horrible, terrible rebellion where a son seeks to be the successor of his father by overturning his father, by destroying his father's kingship. And it all goes back to the fact that an older brother raped a younger sister, Absalom's sister. And Absalom ends up putting Amnon to death. And, and effectively then, Amnon was the first in line for the succession for the kingship of David. Now Absalom becomes first in line. But then he doesn't wait for that. He seeks to seize that. Now, this is all takes place after David sinned with Bathsheba. And you see, David sinned with Bathsheba. And, and remember, Nathan the prophet confronted him and said, you've sinned against the Lord by taking another man's wife, having adultery with her. And then 
murdering, being responsible for the death of that man so that you could marry this woman and cover your sin. Nathan confronts him. David confesses. The Lord forgives him. But Nathan said something ominous. Because you are, because you use the sword the wrong way, because you abuse power. See, see, before Amnon ever abused his power with Tamar, his sister, his father, David, abused his power. And he used the sword, and he said, because of that, the sword will never depart from your family. And unfortunately, Absalom and his rebellion against David is a fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, this, this is a picture here. David is not only identifying with Tamar, he's not only identifying with, with the violence of, of rape against her. He's not only identifying with the misuse of power by the strong over the weak, he's identifying with the fact that he himself abused power. Abuse of power brings devastation to a nation. When, ki when kings in the Old Testament were men and women of blood, when they abused their power, they were overturned by God. Disaster hit the land. So when you have to understand God's people's mindset, and they, they, they were conditioned by this mindset because the Lord said that's what was going to happen. Your sin would cause you to be judged by God. And so when calamity would hit a land, the people would say, what is wrong with our leaders. Again, that's a pattern for America right now. It's a pattern for America. A calamity hit this land before the election. Calamity hit this land. And it's been hitting this land for a long time. But we've been coming to this hour where, where, where the fullness of God's corrective measures take place. So on another level, David is identifying with Absalom's betrayal. So you have, you have Amnon abusing Tamar. You have David abusing his people when he misused power. You have the powerful abusing the weak. And you have this betrayal by Absalom. And so all of this is in Psalm 55. This is... This is multivalence. And that's why the subscription, superscription to Psalm 55 says, to the choir master with stringed instruments, a maskil of David. A maskil is a, is a worship song that instructs God's people. See, this is all about the hindrances to David's kingship and David's successor. Psalm 56 is when David was being, not now things switch back to when Saul was persecuting David. Saul was trying to stop David, to stop David's kingship, to stop the succession. Saul wanted his son Jonathan to have the succession. He, Saul wanted, uh, Saul wanted um, his line, his lineage, his seed to continue. This is very relevant to the United States. We're talking about succession of power going on in the United States from one president to another or one president staying in office and refusing to give that up. This is very similar to the time of Saul and David, the time of kings. The Lord, Scripture says, promotion comes not from the east, the west, nor the south. God is the judge. He sets one up, he raises one up, and he brings another down. So, so let's keep this in mind. But let's also keep in mind that that's not the ultimate issue in succession. Solomon is going to get the succession because that is God's choice, and God's going to work history out in David's favor. One of the things that, um, that, that we see as, as we move through these psalms, if there's going to be forgiveness for David's sin, it's going to be because of the steadfast love of the Lord and the faithfulness of the Lord. 
if David's going to be delivered from mighty men and from fools and from from enemies and from Saul, it's going to be because of the steadfast love of the Lord and the faithfulness of God. If the church is going to come to the place in this hour where it stands for the kingdom, apostolically, prophetically, biblically, righteously, truthfully, in the power of the Spirit, as disciples, it's going to be because of the Lord's grace, his steadfast love and his faithfulness. The dominant terms in the Old Testament may have been steadfast love and faithfulness, and the dominant term in the New Testament may be grace and faith, but it's the same working of the same God. It's the Lord's steadfast love. It's the Lord's faithfulness. It's the Lord's grace and his graciousness. In 56, as Saul pursues David, David is so, so beleaguered by these enemies and the the people of God and mighty men. They're, They're all siding with Saul against David that David has to flee to the Philistines, the very enemies of the Lord. Who's going to save me, Lord, in this hour? i got to run to the idolaters. That's how desperate David was. And the psalm speaks of that desperation. It speaks of another hindrance, that things can get so bad that there seems nowhere righteous to turn. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he found himself in Nazi Germany in the in the, the 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 birth of Nazi Germany early in the 20th century Bonhoeffer as a member of the body of Christ found himself in a position where he said no matter what choice i make in this situation there were the socialists on the left there were the fascists the nazis on the right there was a a, a church that had just totally abandoned the Lord and embraced political means to, to, to bring forth God's righteousness and truth in the earth. There was this, this, this wicked, ungodly man by the name of Hitler. There was the m- merciless, ungodly persecution of the Jews. And by the way, it wasn't only Jews, though they were the predominant ones who perished in the, the death camps, there were people of all kinds of races that were deemed inferior, inferior to the Nazis that perished. Some of my forebears, Eastern European forebears, perished along with the Jews. Sometimes you get in a situation and Bonhoeffer looked around and said, any solution I, I, I take, I violate my conscience. That's, that's Psalm 56. I mean, any, anything, any move David met, any Dave move David took, it, it, just, it was a violation of his conscience. And he ends up with the Philistines and God has to deliver him from that. His, he had to be delivered from his solution. Then Psalm 57, 58, and 59, which is where we closed last week, it's three times, three headings, in the superscription of 57, 58, and 59 speak of the term do not destroy. And five times in 57 and 59, five times the steadfast love of the Lord is mentioned. Do not destroy. In Psalm 57, David has a chance to put an end to Saul's life. And the heading says do not destroy. We are not called to destroy our enemies, brethren. Pastor Jan was saying in, in Psalm 69, there's language there, and, and there's, there's reason for that language. The, the, the level of desperation that the foes of God's purposes bring against us may cause us to cry out in pain, Lord, destroy these enemies. They're, they're seeking not just to destroy me, but to destroy your purposes. But the Lord says in Psalm 57, do not destroy your enemies. Show your enemies grace and mercy. If your enemies are to be destroyed, they're my enemies, the enemies of my kingdom. You leave that in God's hands. You leave that to me. Do not take 
God-like status upon yourselves. The second do not destroy in 58 is do not allow justice to be destroyed. It's, it's, a, it's a psalm that just speaks of justice, and justice is the correct use of power by those whom God grants that power. Those who are the powers and principalities, the, the rulers and the authorities, according to Romans 13, they can rule righteously and justly in the name of the Lord. That's what Israel was called to do. That's what the kings of Israel were called to do. And that's the, what the kings of the surrounding nations, those nations that surrounded Israel, were called to do. But those nations can turn beast-like, as in we move from Romans 13 to Revelation 13. And the beast absolute misuse of power, trying to establish its own lordship and godship in the earth. Do not allow justice to be destroyed. And if we do not destroy our enemies and we do not allow justice to be destroyed, in 59, God will not allow our enemies to destroy us. Now that brings us to 60. 60. Psalm 60, the, the introduction, the superscription to the choir master, according to Shishan Eduth, that's the testimony of the lilies. Or as some exegetes say, the testimony of the rose. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a little bit of controversy over whether uh, Shushan in the Hebrew refers to a lily or refers to a rose, but they both speak of a beautiful precious flower and a bearing witness to that. It's a miktam of David. A miktam is uh, a psalm that uh, comprises two words, mik, which is the Hebrew word for humility, and tam, which is the, the Hebrew word for blamelessness. It's a devotion to the Lord and the Lord's purposes through humility that makes us blameless before the Lord. Blameless doesn't mean sinless perfection. It means that I have a perfect heart towards God. I have a blameless heart toward God. My heart is always turned to God. David sinned, but he's the man after God's own heart. He's miktam. He's, when he's humbled, he receives that correction from God. And he allows that correction of God to perfect his heart's devotion, that he will have single-hearted devotion to God's purposes and God's kingdom. Now, it's for instruction when he strove with two uh, aspects of the house of Aram, the Syrians, and when Joab, on his return, struck down the 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of Salt. Now, this this. Shushan Eduth, this this putting lilies or roses uh, into the um, subtitle, the superscription of the psalm. We've already seen that in Psalm 45, which speaks of the messianic king, the Lord's anointed. It, it, it shows that, that what David is going through is not just about himself. It's not just about Israel. It's not even just about Who's going to succeed him to the throne? There's a bigger purpose in what's going on in Israel's life and David's life and Solomon's life and the kingship and the destiny of the nation Israel. And that is, there is a messianic purpose in all this. This is all pointing to something greater than all of us. What we are going through right now, today as a church. Okay, as an American church. Is it about America? Of course it's about America. Is it about the church? Yes, it is about the church. Is it about us as individuals? Yes, it is. Is it about true and false prophecy in the church? Yes, it is. Is it about true and false doctrine in the church? Yes, it is. But it's about something greater. Everything points to something greater. And see this term, to the lilies, this term, to the rose, <laughs> whichever one you like, choose. It speaks of a prophetic dimension way beyond our own personal history and histories as a nation and as a people. So what's interesting, 
This refers to 2 Samuel chapter 10. We're not going to look at it, just going to give you a brief summary. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, uh, David's kingship now has been established. I mean, Saul died at the end of 1 Samuel. Now we're, we're 10, 10 chapters into 2 Samuel. This is bef just before the sin uh, of David and Bathsheba. And we're seeing this establishment of David's kingdom. And what's happening is David, once he becomes king, the nation of Israel is, is it's, it's prospering. It's being blessed. Everything, God, is, God is, is, is showing justice to the poor. The enemies of God's people are being subdued. David is a mighty man. The spirit of God is being poured out. The borders of Israel are increasing. You know, the, the largest borders that Israel ever had, Israel as a nation, it's, it's dominance, it's a short dominance, but it's under the kingship of David and under the kingship of Solomon. But David really prepares everything for Solomon. David doesn't build the temple, but everything he does, he prepares for the building of the temple. And that's one of the themes here, the theological themes in 51 through 72. David does, doesn't build the temple, his son Solomon does, but David lays the groundwork. Just as Moses doesn't take the people in the land, Joshua does, but Moses lays the groundwork. And for those of you who are getting gray hair, who are old, we are the, the elderly, the older. Now, we may not build the temple, we may not lead the people in the land, but it is our job right now to prepare God's people to do it. The generation that's coming after us, the successors that are coming after us, it is our job to prepare the way for them. And we've got to do it right, and we've got to get it right in this time of false prophecy. America cannot be exalted, and, and America cannot be the model for, for discipleship. The church has to be the model, and we need to get rid of the false prophecy that says the one thing and establish the true prophecy according to the eschatological purpose and plan in Scripture to get that in motion. So actually this psalm the historical reference to this psalm in the superscription, it's David conquering Edom, David conquering Moab, David, David conquering Amnon, uh, um, Moab and Ammon, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites. Too many similar sounding words and I'm confusing them here. The Ammonites, the Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines are being brought in subjection. The Arameans are being brought into subjection. And yet, if you are to read this psalm, the psalm speaks words completely different from the historical circumstances. This should be a psalm saying, look at all the great things David's accomplished. He's subduing the nations to the Lord and the Lord's people. And look how it starts out with, oh God, you've rejected us. You've broken our defenses. You've been angry. Restore us. You have made the land a quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink and made us stagger. You've set up a banner for those who fear you that they may flee to it from the bow. Selah. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation to your right hand and answer us. H how is it that in the middle of a historical triumph, David's psalm is completely different? It's because now here's another hindrance. Here's another hindrance to the establishment of God's kingdom. In our successes, we don't see the future. And we allow our successes to actually be the very thing that destroys us. America, the greatest nation that ever lived. Well, if, that's, if, that, if, if that was what God's hand granted to America, so be it. But Deuteronomy 8, when you take the land, see to it that you don't say, my own hand has gotten me these things. And always remember 
these things came from the Lord. See, our failures can hinder God's kingdom purposes, but so can our successes. And that's why David has to do miktams. There has to be a lot of humbling. God needs to humble his people. He needs to humble the nations of the earth. He needs to humble them. May I say this? America is being humbled right now. And, and we'll, we'll see as, as, as we continue in these succession psalms. And all of a sudden, I mean, no, notice, I mean, it just, it's, it's amazing what this psalm is saying to us. Don't be blinded by your successes. Your successes do not make you something or someone. Oh my gosh, you hear the church? The fate of America hangs in the balance right now. No, the fate of the kingdom of God hangs in the balance. Whatever happens to America, the fate of the kingdom. And P.S., spoiler alert. Did you see the did you did you see the little clip on the on on, on this the forthcoming Marvel uh, uh, series that's coming out? Well, here's here's the spoiler alert: the church flourishes flourishes in times of great oppression, and the church tends to founder. It tends to struggle in times of great prosperity. We cannot allow success and blessing to blind our eyes from the kingdom. They both can. Look at what it says in this psalm. Psalm 6, God has spoken in his holiness. holiness. With exaltation I will divide up Shechem and portion out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Speaks of all the boundaries of the land of Israel. And it's increasing according to 2 Samuel 10 at this particular time in David's life. And it's not only the borders are increasing and the, the inheritance is being given to the tribes and the, these, these areas, uh, uh, geographic areas speak of God's giving the gift of the land to the people. But then the enemies of the Lord are being subjected to the Lord. They're being subdued. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. The enemies of God's people are being put down. And then David says something amazing. This is, this is a prophecy because it says in verse 6, God has spoken. So these are the words of the Lord. The Lord now is prophesying through David, the writer of this psalm. And the Lord says, in the midst of this great success of Israel, who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? Wait a second. Who will lead you to the fortified city of Edom? The strong, impregnable, mountainous city of Edom? Da David's conquered Edom. Ah, but there's a prophetic vision. Edom were the descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. And Rabbinic teaching, rabbinic history, Old Testament teaching and history says Edom would become the Roman Empire. The descendants of Esau would take over the world as the greatest nation ever to live, Edom. And Rome in the future. D David is seeing, David is seeing nearly a thousand years into the future. And Edom will be the fortified city that opposes God's kingdom. Edom is Rome. That's the nation that crucified the Lord. That's the nation that tried to become the most dominant nation of the earth and say, the kingdom of God? No, the kingdom of Rome. Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our enemies. Please don't let Edom triumph. O oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the deliverance that man brings. Political deliverance, vain. Deliverance by Yahweh, deliverance by the Lord Jesus, deliverance by his kingdom. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. 61 then, to the choir master, 
with stringed instruments of David. Now we've seen all of these enemies, including David's success as his enemy. What enemy is left? Well, here's what David says in Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I do call to you. When my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. And that shelter of his wings has been a common theme in Psalms 51 through 72. Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows, and you have given me the inheritance of those who fear your name. Now, it's all about inheritance and what David is understanding from Psalm 51 through here to Psalm 61 is the inheritance comes through the fear of the Lord. All these enemies, all these oppositions, success, failure, everywhere you turn, opposition, but it's the fear of the Lord that will bring us into our inheritance. It's the fear of the Lord that will bring Israel out of Egypt. It's the fear of the Lord that will bring Israel into the land. And it's the fear of the Lord that will establish God's kingdom in the earth. And then it says, prolong the life of the king. May his year, years endure to all generations. Now, we're in this whole succession theme here. Preserve my life so that I can hand the succession over to Solomon, who will carry it on until Messiah comes, until the anointed one comes, until Jesus comes, until Edom and the power of Rome is broken through the power of the cross. May the king be enthroned forever before God. Appoint, and here it is, it's always there in these psalms. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over the king. So this whole issue of his succession, David's succession, we're seeing all these enemies, including his own sin, including those outside of him, including his own success. These are all potential hindrances to the kingdom being established. But God counters with his steadfast love and his faithfulness, and it watches over God's people in this hour. So will I ever sing praises to your name. I will perform my vows day after day. Where has David gone that he would say, from the end of the earth, I cry unto you. I call out to you. I mean, I've, I've been through Saul. I, I, I've been through the uh, subduing the Philistines and the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Edomites. I, I've dealt with my sin. Well, my wife asked me last week when she read Psalm 62, just like she asked this week when she uh, talked about Psalm 69, who, who, who's, who's David talking about here? Who, who is he writing about? And my, my wife said when she got to Psalm 62, to the choir master, that's the superscription to 62, to the choir master, according to Jeduthun, a psalm of David, Jeduthun is putting to music, he's, he's one of the prophetic worship leaders of David. He's, the, he's the, the, the third of three houses. He's the youngest of the three houses of, of, of prophetic worshipers uh, among the priesthood that David had. He's putting it to music. And my wife said to me, is, is he talking in Psalm 62 about Absalom? And I said, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. And then I went back to Psalm 61 and I, I did some digging. From the end of the earth, I call unto you. Where would David be in the end of the earth in 61? Would he be there in 62? How about 63? 63 gives us the clue. A Psalm of David, the superscription of Psalm 63, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. And when was he in the wilderness of Judah? When Absalom, his son, sought to overturn and overthrow David's kingship and received the succession himself. It's Absalom wanting to succeed his father when he wasn't the true successor. Even though he was in line to do it, the Lord had told David it would be through Solomon, the firstborn of, of, of David and Bathsheba. So 61, David is in the wilderness of Judah when he was driven out of Jerusalem and he and his men had to go hide in the forests 
in the wilderness, in, when they were banished and exiled. It's talking about betrayal by your own people while you're in the midst of your people. Now, I want you to understand how serious the issue with Absalom is. Keep your hand in 61, 62, and 63, but go with me to the first three Psalms. Book one, Psalm one, two, and three. We said this, that, that Psalm one, which is about the righteous versus the wicked, has no superscription, and Psalm two, which is about the Messiah, God's anointed, receiving authority over all the nations of the earth. Those two psalms sum up the entire theme of the 150 psalms in the Psalter. They're setting in motion what is going to be God's theological perspective, God's eschatological purposes. Everything about God establishing his kingdom in the earth, two things. It's righteousness versus wickedness. Will God's people embrace righteousness or will God's people walk in wickedness? And we know that the Antichrist is called the wicked one. So righteousness and wickedness is, is, is bigger than just a personal, individual, moral issue. It talks about, do we follow Jesus, the righteous one, or do we follow the wicked one? Embodied in the powers of the earth, the political entities of the earth that oppose God's kingdom and seek to obtain the authority of God's kingdom themselves. Read Daniel 7 over and over and over again. I've preached that for 50 years. Beasts come before the ancient of days and say, we want the authority of the kingdom, but it's given to the Son of Man. So Psalm 1. Righteousness versus wickedness. Psalm 2, look at the first verses. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his anointed one, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The second major principle in God's kingdom purposes being established in the earth and the Lord's kingdom purposes is Messiah. Will we submit to the rule of God's man, the Lord Jesus? And that is the answer to the wickedness, righteousness question. But now watch what the first superscribed titled Psalm is when we get to Psalm 3. Psalm 1, righteousness versus wickedness. Psalm 2, the establishment of God's kingdom in the earth. Psalm 3, it's the only time that Absalom is mentioned in all of the Psalms. And it's a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. And what is said here is there's going to be something so significant about the rebellion of Absalom. Read it and, and read, read, read you know, start really with, with 2 Samuel 11 and read all the way through to 2 Samuel 17. It starts with the sin of David and Bathsheba, the rebuke of Nathan, the rape of Tamar, Amnon being put to death for raping Tamar by his brother and her brother, Absalom, and then the revolt of Absalom. And it's saying that there is something ultimate, something ultra-significant, centrally significant to the establishment of Messiah's reign and rule in the earth versus righteousness against wickedness. There's something very symptomatic about Absalom trying to overturn David. It's the ultimate enemy, betrayal by your own family. And so what I'm saying through this, in this hour, the ultimate issue 
if we're going to side with God or oppose God, if we're going to side with righteousness against wickedness, or we're going to side with wickedness against righteousness. It's internecine conflict. It's family conflict. The church fighting with each other. Spirit of David, spirit of Absalom in the body of Christ right now. Ultimate. Ultimate. What is the most important issue right now in history right now? It's the inter Nessing conflict. I mean, what, what, when I say the most important issue in history right now, what is going to make it or break it for the kingdom being established in the earth? Save me, O oh my God. David says in Psalm 3, verse 1, O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. And when would they say that? When they see Absalom attempt to overthrow David. Now back to Psalms 61, 62, 63. And, and, and let me make this point here. If in Psalm 60, we, we speak of the success, we speak of the success of David. David was so loved by God's people. I, I said it, he brought justice, he brought blessing. He brought prosperity. He brought true biblical teaching. He brought worship. He restored worship back to Israel. He established the, the, the tabernacle of David, which was the precursor of the temple, where the presence of the Lord dwelled in a tent and God's people rejoiced and were, were rejuvenated, were, were empowered by the Spirit of the Lord. All these incredible things that David accomplished. Why were they willing to side with Absalom and turn against him? Well, I've also alluded to this. When any one of these three things hit the land, warfare, civil dispute, civil disruption, warfare, famine, and plague, when any one of those three things took place in a land, the people looked at their leader and said, what has our leader done that God would judge the nation? What sin has he committed? Well, where does this whole sequence start? Psalm 51, David sinned and everybody knew about the sin and everybody knew about the blood guilt that was on his hand and the immorality, the sexual immorality. There, 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 there is potential thinking there's potential thinking behind the story of Bathsheba and David that Bathsheba was raised in the house of David. She was a little girl raised in the house of David, grew up into this beautiful woman, and David lusted after her. What a violation. What a violation, brethren, of power and abuse of power. Ahithophel, her grandfather, the grandfather of Bathsheba, sided with Absalom to lead the rebellion against David because Ahithophel said this man was evil. David sinned. And now David's going to be overturned for his sin. But this is what we have to understand. This is where internecine conflict starts. Brethren, in the body of Christ, we all fail. We all make mistakes. We all sin. And the bitterness of Absalom, the bitterness of Ahithophel toward David, the, the fears of God's people seeing all this devastation taking place and saying, he sinned, it's on him, leads to this conflict. How we must seek grace and mercy and forgiveness. Now watch this. In Psalm 62, remember David, 61, 62 and onward is about the conflict. These Psalms are birthed in the conflict with Absalom. David says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. I wait in silent submission. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not greatly be 
shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? My only plan to thrust him down, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse Selah. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is in him. And then David says at the end of the psalm, Verse 11, once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. Power belongs to the Lord, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love. For you will render to a man according to his work. You'll render a man according to his work, and those who oppose your plans will receive that. Those who wait in silent submission for you, O God. Your steadfast love will be the demonstration of your power. In Psalm 63, when David's in the wilderness, he's there because Absalom has put him there. And he says in Psalm 63, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek for you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there's no water. Exile and the potential failure of the purposes of God if Absalom is established and David does not stay in the kingship. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. And again, it's your steadfast love because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. And again, he speaks in the seventh verse. You've been my help in the shadow of your wings. I will seek for joy. My soul clings to you. See, see David, in this most desperate place, this this final enemy, this internecine conflict. And again, make no mistake, I'm not talking about who's president and who's not president. Talking about Jesus. We're talking about the Lord's kingdom purposes being established in the earth. The Lord's purposes, not the purposes of a nation. We pray for our nation. We desire good things for our nation. But as the church goes, so the nation goes. And a church divided is David versus Absalom. Members of the church, not members of the world or political parties, members of the church at war with each other. Verse 11, the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exalt, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Where are the liars? Where are the, where's the mouth of falsehood right here? Anything that keeps us from seeing Jesus as king and Jesus as Lord. That keeps the church from being unified in Christ. Psalm 64 Hear my voice, O God, in in my complaint. Preserve my life from the dread of the enemy. We're still dealing with the, the Absalom affair. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, the secret counsels. See, there's a heavenly council, and, and Jeremiah 23 says the true prophets of the Lord stand in his council. They don't just give prophecies out of a vision of their own hearts and a vision of their own imaginations and how they want to see things turn out and how they can keep their present way of life uh, continuing the way it is. But those who stand in the secret council of the Lord are the true prophetic and apostolic voices that see God's purposes. But see, there's a secret counsel that the enemies of God have. And, and David's saying, yeah, there, there are secret counsels of hell as well as secret counsels of heaven. Please hide me from their plots. Hide me from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. David asks Verse 10, let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. As the counsels, the secret counsels of those who seek to undermine God's kingdom shoot arrows at God's 
people. They aim bitter words like arrows in verse 3. Verse 7 says God turns the tables, but God shoots his arrow at them. They are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. False prophecy. All who see them will wag their heads. Then all mankind will fear. They will tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. We need to understand exactly what the Lord is doing in this hour. He's setting everything up. This is, this is a, 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 a major turning point in American history. This is a major turning point in human history. This is a major turning point in the history of the church. Absalom versus David. It's, it's internecine. It's not about America versus Russia versus China. It's about, it's about the internecine warfare. Absalom versus David. And now the Lord, this is what the Lord's going to do. He's going to set it up because people are shooting arrows at each other in the body of Christ on the internet with their theories, with their their interpretations, with their prophecies, with their teachings. The Lord is setting things up because he's going to illustrate a lesson. See, that this Psalm 64, is he's, he, the Lord's letting it come to a head. And God recognizes who is shooting arrows from hell at their brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord's setting it up and a lesson is going to be made. The Lord is going to bring somebody into judgment. A miktam of David, humility. The word miktam, humility that leads to pure devotion, single-hearted devotion to Christ. The Lord is going to let this whole thing work out and there's going to be a lesson. Gee, Pastor Oz, why are you, you know... you guys are meeting. You're not meeting. You're 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 not gathering together. You, you know you're 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 not. You're letting our constitutional rights be taken from us, and we're not meeting together. I'm waiting, because the Lord is setting the table. God is going to appear. God is going to move. God is going to judge, and God is going to show what He desires. And in the end. Everybody's going to get humbled. Absalom got humbled because he got judged. David got humbled because it was his own son that turned against him. Nobody escapes the humility that God wants to see in the body of Christ now, where we wash each other's feet, where we hear each other, where we listen to each other. Okay, 25 million voted for Trump. 25 million Christians voted for Trump. Well, 25 million voted against him. Give me a break. When are we going to come together and listen to what each other has to say when we're humbled by God? It's coming, brethren. It's coming. And then 65, 66, 67, and 68 are all of a sudden called not only a psalm of David, but they're called a song. A song is just a shir, S-H-I-R, or shira in Hebrew. And let me read to you a comment by um, S.R. Hirsch. This is, this is uh, his comment on the Hebrew word shir and the Hebrew word shira. These four groups of psalms, and we're, 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 we're closing here, 65 through 68, and of course, I just got my uh, marker out of my book where I wanted to read this. 65 through 68 are these four psalms that are called songs in Hebrew. And this is what, this is what Hirsch says, I quote, This psalm, the first psalm 65, this psalm is dedicated to the one 
who exalts man to spiritual victory in earthly conflicts. Remember we said that in Hebrew, where we see in English to the choir master. Hebrew, what that says is to the one who gives the victory. See, the ultimate choir master is not the head of worship in, 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 a, in, in the Jewish Psalter. Or it's not the head of worship in the church on the earth. The Lord is the ultimate choir master. So when these psalms say to the choir master, it's to him who gives the victory. It's to the Lord. He's the one who gives spiritual victory and the exaltation to David, to the choir master, the one who gives victory to David, who puts it as a psalm, which means sets it to music, and then also calls it a sheer. It's not called a psalm and a song, but it is in these four, next four consecutive psalms. And Hirsch says, David, because of the victory that God gives him in, with Absalom and all of these conflicts that run from 51 to 72, David forms on the wings of a dove the wings of a song. And see, we see under the shelter of his wing, under the shadow of his wing, is a familiar theme in these Psalms of David here at this point. Shear, in Hebrew, is a song in which the hand of God is beheld as it rules in the course of human history. That's what a song is. It's a song sung to the one who makes human history go the way he wants it towards his kingdom purposes and his victory. Shear is the masculine form of the word, and shira is the feminine form. Hirsch says, and he was a rabbi in the 19th century, shear in the masculine form means ultimate redemption that takes place in the future. It's a song that declares ultimate redemption taking place in the future when it's in the masculine. When it's in the feminine, shira, it indicates a song that deals with the present acts of God which ultimately lead to his kingdom fulfillment. This is masculine, so it's prophetic. And everything David is saying is, just as you've given me the victory over Absalom, and he did, God gave him the victory over Absalom, then God will give his people the victory. Now, I want you to see what David says in Psalm 65, and we're going to close. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hears prayer, to you all flesh shall come. How, how did David get through all of these, this opposition, his own sin, enemies, success, his own son? Prayer, intercessory prayer, petition, supplication, a crying out to God. O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When iniquities prevail against me, and that's the Hebrew word aven, and I said iniquity in Hebrew has to do with the destructive consequences of sin. David started this in Psalm 51. He says all of this rebellion, this famine, this pestilence. You're going to see famine in 2 Samuel 21, pestilence in 2 Samuel 24, war with Absalom previous to that. Those are the three things that God uses when he is displeased with the, the way authority uses power in a land to turn them to the Lord or turn them away from the Lord. David recognized his own sin set this into motion. And so he says, when I see the destructive results of my own sin and the sin of my people, he says, when iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Remember what we said transgression was in Psalm 51. That describes the sin with Bathsheba and the sin with Uriah. Transgression is willful rebellion against the Lord. See, David is saying, I willfully rebelled against you, Lord, and all of this is set in motion. The devastation, the internecine conflict between me and my son, the rape of my daughter Tamar, my, my son Amnon, raping Tamar the way I raped Bathsheba. It's, it's my hand. It was my transgression. But Lord, 
when the devastation for my sins prevail against me, against my nation, against my people, you atone for our transgressions. And he says, blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. God forgives. I'm the man, David says. God forgives. Saul continues in his rebellion. Absalom continues in his rebellion. They're judged. I'm the man and God forgives. God forgive your people in this hour right now. For, forgive us for not walking in John 17. I pray that they may be one, Father, as you are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may know that God the Father sent God the Son. The world may know that you sent me. The church fighting over who's president, fighting over Democrat and Republican perspectives of righteousness, just human perspectives of righteousness, fighting with one another and assuming that who gets in the presidency is going to cause the world to believe that God sent Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us in the name of Jesus. And then Psalm 66 and Psalm 67 are not titled as the Psalms of David. They're the community response to Psalm 65. Psalm 65, at the end of it, God sends rain to counter the pestilence, to counter the famine, to counter the war. God sends rain, and rain speaks of God's blessing. God forgives, the church repents, God sends blessing. And, 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 and when he sends blessing, Psalm 65, 11. Remember, 65 was our psalm on the day before New Year's Eve. 65, we're reading one of these a day, 365th day of the year, 65th psalm. And look what verse 11 says. When God forgives us because we repent, because we submit to his humbling of us. You crown the year with your blessing. Verse 11, Psalm 65. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. Your, your, your heavenly chariot wagon tracks through the heavens release blessings, release rain. And the, the conclusion of Psalm 65, the people of God shout and sing together for joy when the Lord turns the fortunes of David. And that's why Psalm 66 starts where Psalm 65 ends. Psalm 65, that's the end of David's psalms. And then there are two psalms and the people respond. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing glory unto his name. Psalm 66 starts with praise and ends with a declaration that God has heard our prayer. Psalm 66, 16, come and hear all you who fear God and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cry to him with my mouth and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Church, do not hold iniquity in our heart. Bitterness, hostility, toward our brothers and sisters, the acceptation of false prophecy and false teaching over the word of God, having greater solidarity to a presidential candidate than your own brothers and sisters in Christ. Please do not regard iniquity in our heart any longer. We need to look to the real successor, Solomon the one greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus, who is going to establish his kingdom. That's the whole point here. David couldn't beat down all of these enemies, Psalm 51 through Psalm 71, to try to get the successor. God had to move. It is his steadfast love. Verse 19, but truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. And then Psalm 67, again, the community responds. 
May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth and your saving power among all nations. Book of Revelation doesn't say in the end America will bring its glory into the temple of God. America, Russia, China, Islamic states, India, they're all going to bring them in because God is going to move in the earth. Making the greatest issue in life what happens in America, your God is too small. That's too small. He's going to redeem all the nations. He will make his way known on the earth, his saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples, that's all the people groups of the earth, let the nations be glad and sing for joy for you. Judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. And then Psalm 68, and we'll close here. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Psalm 68 is incredible. Read Psalm 68 today. It was yesterday's psalm. But Psalm 68 is the closing of these four psalms entitled A Song. And in this song, the key verse, I just, the key verse, this is a psalm that was sung on Pentecost for the giving of the law at Sinai. But it says that Sinai finds its way to Zion. This is the Lord appears in his glory. God arises. His enemies are scattered. He brings his presence to Zion. Sinai gets relocated in Zion. The law, the written word, the giving of the spirit, it all comes together in Zion where God is king and his kingly presence influences all of human history. And here it is. O mountain of God, verse 15, mountain of Bashan, O many peak mountain, mountain of Bashan, the highest mountain in Israel. Zion's not as tall as Bashan. Oh, the church moving, it's not as spectacular as a whole nation exercising authority in the earth. Well, it may be smaller on the out, it might be small on the outside, but it's big on the inside. It's a TARDIS, okay? Hallelujah. O mountain of God, mountain of Bashan, O many peak mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain? Speaking of the nations of the earth and their kingly authority, their political rule, the extent of their political influence. Why do you look with hatred, O many peaked mountain, at the mount that God desired for his dwelling place? Yes, where will the Lord dwell forever? The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. Paul quoted that in Ephesians 4 when he led into what real fivefold ministry is in the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, you need the perspective of David in Psalm 51 through Psalm 72. You need to follow that eschatological scheme that the word of God lays out for us. Zion is the place of God's presence. And because of Zion's sake, God fulfills his purposes. And then we go through Psalm 69, 70, and 71. And what's the final Psalm of book two? From 51 to 72, the second Davidic Psalter, it's for Solomon. Psalm 72 ends, Solomon succeeded. And one greater than Solomon will succeed in accomplishing his kingdom purposes in the earth. Father, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. Get us right, O oh God. May we embrace Miktam. May we be humbled as you are humbling America and humbling the church and humbling the nations of the earth. May we submit to your humility. May we submit to your humility and may it increase within us devotion for your plan and your purposes. And may you remove idolatry, any idolatry, every idolatry, the idolatry of self, 
the idolatry of success, the idolatry of prosperity, national idolatry. Remove idolatry from your people in this hour, and may we see the real Solomon established. Adonijah versus Solomon is not two presidential candidates. It's all presidents versus the real Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ. So people ask me, how long is this going to go on? When are we coming back to church? Well, here's what I say. When we see what God is doing, when God makes it clear, we'll be back in church. And by back in church, what I mean by that is the real church, functioning like the real church. It, that doesn't mean whether we're meeting together, not meeting together, meeting on Zoom, meeting online. When will the real church come together in Christ? That's when we'll be back. Father, do it in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Took a long time, but I feel like these things have to be said. God bless you, brethren. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.